All right, so as Russia is continuing their ongoing invasion of Ukraine, it honestly, at least at surface level, doesn't really seem like there are many winners to this situation, not the Ukrainian people for very obvious reasons, but also not even Vladimir Putin necessarily, who has been made into public enemy number one and who has been stalled largely on most of their main military objectives, at least so far, and also not the Russian people who have been uh, suffering under essentially being cut off from the entire global financial system. But as usual, during times of war like this, there are always going to be winners. And usually those winners reside in the military industrial complex. And so I got some news here from uh, Common Dreams, Jake Johnson, pointing out just the extent to which uh, these weapons manufacturers have been profiting from the tensions leading up to the war in Ukraine, as well as the, uh, you know, follow through funding that inevitably came from the United States and from uh, countries around the world deciding to throw more money at our already bloated military budget. So here from uh, Jake Johnson, he says, Biden asked, Congress to approve a record $813 billion in military spending. And they say the Hawks in Washington want to jack up the military budget and use Ukraine as an excuse, warned one analyst. So a little bit of details here. He says, rebuffing uh, progressive lawmakers calls for Pentagon spending cuts. President Joe Biden on Monday is set to unveil a budget blueprint for the next fiscal year. That includes a record $813 billion in funds for the U.S. military apparatus, a $31 billion increase from the current level. And they say the president's fiscal year uh, 2023 budget request, which must be approved by Congress, is expected to contain $773 billion for just the Pentagon, as well as billions in funding for the energy department's maintenance of the country's nuclear arsenal. So I would hope or think, at least in a situation like this, if we had a, a rational country here, that the prospects of a nuclear war, as we are seeing right now, escalate, uh, at least recently, would maybe give us an indication that we should start to reduce uh, our nuclear weapons arsenal instead of trying to build it up and uh, prepare ourselves for Cold War II electric boogaloo. But nonetheless, we're investing substantially in maintaining our nuclear arsenal instead of dismantling it. Uh, but also $773 billion for just the Pentagon, the same Pentagon that can't even pass an audit to tell us where this money has been going or is going right now. So, I mean, you want to talk about fiscal responsibility and all these motherfuckers like Joe Manchin and other, you know, conservatives within the Democratic and Republican parties who come out and preach about fiscal responsibility and then don't even bat an eye when they pass through a budget like this, $773 billion that are essentially virtually unaccountable to the American taxpayers or to uh, Congress in terms of exactly where they're throwing this money. So it's it's a fiscal black hole, and yet you never hear the same pushback that you would hear from people like Joe Manchin and other conservatives when it comes to things like social welfare policies or any actual investments in the working class uh, here in America or really anything that would actually benefit the country instead of just throwing more money at defense contractors who lobby a lot of these politicians. But again, just completely absurd amount uh, to just toss at the Pentagon casually. But they continue with a little bit more detail saying the president's latest budget proposal will land on Capitol Hill amid Russia's deadly invasion of Ukraine, which has thus far proven to be a major boon for the U.S. weapons industry as the Biden administration pours arms into the besieged country. So listen, first off, uh, I'm not even necessarily against giving some defensive weapons to Ukraine at all, right? I'm against Russia's invasion. I think it was totally unjustified. Putin, uh, I would classify him as an imperialist war criminal, but uh, none of this is to say that like you shouldn't necessarily give Ukraine support to defend themselves from this invasion. Now, I think there's an extent to which you can be supplying things in excess or be focusing way too much on giving military assistance instead of trying to push for diplomacy, which is where I think we've ended up right now. But I mean, none of this is has anything to do with the profit margins that we have been seeing from a lot of these defense companies, which is really my main critique here, right? It's one thing to say Ukrainians deserve to defend their territory. Sure, I absolutely agree with that. It's another thing to say that we should allow, you know, private companies to lobby politicians to push us ever closer to expanding conflict and war and uh, to, to allow them to essentially profit from conflicts like the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. So two different things there. And I think that nuance is kind of important. But uh, the, we continue here with uh, In These Times. I'll link this down below if you should really go read this entire article. But basically, you don't have to trust my opinion 
opinion on any of this in terms of the incentives where the military industrial complex wants to lead our government further towards the likelihood of war uh, because that's exactly where they make their money and it's exactly where CEOs in recent uh, earnings calls with some of their investors have openly bragged about some of these tensions. So uh, they say here first with the uh, Raytheon CEO that on a January 25th earnings call, which was noted on Twitter by Nick Cleveland Stout of the Quincy Institute, Hayes included, and Hayes is the CEO of Raytheon again, that tensions in Eastern Europe among the factors are among the factors that Raytheon stands to benefit from. And he said, we just have to look at, uh, we just have to look to where last week, where we saw the drone attack in the UAE, they're talking about the Houthi rebels who bombed uh, the UAE with a drone strike, uh, which have attacked some of their other facilities. And of course, the tensions in Eastern Europe, the tensions in the South China see all of those things are putting pressure on some of the defense spending over there so i fully expect we're going to see some benefit from it again benefit from it he's talking about the prospects of a confrontation between the united states empire and either russia or china or wherever it may be around the world it doesn't really matter to them because all of those things would be beneficial to their bottom line that's essentially what he's saying but they continue saying that Raytheon isn't alone in its projections, and among those uh, noting the likely boost to its profit is Jim Taislet, the chairman, president, and CEO of Lockheed Martin. And then they say in a January 25th earnings call, he told investors, quote, if you look at the evolving threat level and approach that some countries are taking, including North Korea, Iran, and some of its proxies in Yemen and elsewhere, and especially Russia today, these days, and China, there's renewed great power competition that does include national defense and threats to it. So in other words, what he's saying here is Cold War II electric boogaloo is going to be massively profitable for them. They need this narrative of the United States confronting China or the United States confronting Russia militarily or otherwise in the sense of their, you know, a growing power on the global stage. We are a, a dying and decrepit empire and uh, we're trying to, you know, cling on to that last uh, grip of power that we're trying to project around the world. But they're saying all of this is good. All of this is good for their bottom lines. It's good for their profit margins. Okay, again, they don't care about the actual threat to civilians or the threat to uh, global peace, they in fact are pushing for the opposite of that. And it's pretty you know, clear in exactly what they're saying here. When he's talking about Yemen here, okay, the, what he's talking about is giving weapons to Saudi Arabia, okay? He's talking about giving weapons directly to massive human rights abusers and people who are in Yemen, at least, uh, conducting widespread uh, war crimes by bombing civilian infrastructure and innocent civilians. So again, he's bragging about being able to use the tensions that we have been seeing to ramp up sales, arms sales, to violent theocratic monarchies, okay? So again, you see exactly what his priorities are and what he actually cares about, not exactly you know anything that's to the benefit of our national security. In fact, they're jeopardizing our national security in many ways. But he is right about one thing, and that is that this has been a boon to their profit margins. So here, just, just as one example, again, this is across the board with the entirety of the weapons industry. But uh, Raytheon, over the last six months, roughly since this buildup on Ukraine's border started, uh, you know, their stock price has absolutely uh, skyrocketed, taken off and uh, increased by, what, like 12 to 16 percent here. Uh, and you can even get down to the day, right? OK, so if you go and look, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine roughly on like February 24th, I think it was and uh, you see the stock price went up by damn near 10 percent within just a couple days of the invasion starting so again you see exactly the conflict of interest here and they're not the only ones so uh, less than three full months into 2022 lockheed martin's stock has surged by more than 25 percent while the share prices of raytheon general dynamics and northrop grumman have also risen risen by roughly 12 percent 14 percent and 16 percent respectively and uh you know these are some of the very clear winners from this war right same as they were the winners from the afghan war the uh, Iraq war, etc. These are private corporations who thrive and make their money whenever there is conflict, whenever there is violence and weapons need to be manufactured to be used on innocent civilians around the world. So this is exactly where they're making their money in a time like this. And again, this isn't just them being the winners. It's also how deeply baked within um, our Congress the military industrial complex actually is. So just as a reminder, I've covered this story just a billion times by now, but from Business Insider, they say at least 15 lawmakers who shape U.S. defense policy have investments in military contractors. So in other words, the same people who get to decide the Pentagon budget and other you know, legislation and have a massive influence over the likelihood of us going to war directly or participating in wars uh, you know, like we're doing in Ukraine or otherwise, these people have direct investments and ties to the same companies who are literally making the vast bulk of their revenue from the Pentagon budget and from public funds. So again, 
then just rampant corruption. It's straight up in your face at surface at surface level. Like these are people who sit on the House and Senate Armed Services uh, committees. Okay, so you know they're not even really trying to hide it to any degree. And you can even get more specific than just generalized investments in the uh, defense industry. So again, here from Business Insider, American-made Javelin and Stinger missiles are heading to Ukraine, and at least 19 members of Congress personally invest in the defense contractors behind them. So listen, at the end of the day, the lesson here isn't necessarily like, oh, we never should have given any defensive capabilities to Ukraine so they can, you know, help bolster their case for defense. That's not really the argument at all. First of all, the argument is don't let politicians own stock whatsoever, but definitely don't let them own stock in uh, essentially war and allow them to profit from the likelihood of war when they sit on the Armed Services Committee and have direct influence over our military budgets. That seems like it should be pretty baseline. If you don't want to have just rampant corruption within your political system, you would take that step. Obviously, we haven't been able to do that so far, but that's step number one. That's one of the main lessons you could take from this. Another lesson you could take from this is, um, you know, we shouldn't have a privatized uh, defense industry that operates largely for profit and then has the ability to lobby politicians to either increase the military budget or increase uh, the American empire's footprint around the world or increase the likelihood that we're going to continue shipping weapons to uh, theocratic, violent monarchies like Saudi Arabia who are conducting a genocide in Yemen and using U.S. made weapons to do so. It's like, you know, those are the types of lessons you should be taking from this, right? It's one thing to support Ukraine defending themselves. That's all fine and good, but let's not do it to appease the defense industry. Let's not do it because some corrupt politicians are sitting on the Armed Services Committee and are having direct influence over this type of legislation.